I want to ask you a question, and I want you to think of something, the first thing that comes to mind when I say a word. So are you ready? Yeah, I've got a lot of like, you're definitely ready. You're like, I'm ready. Um, all right, so here's the word. What is one of the first things that comes to mind when I say the word home? And some of you may have thought of, you know, maybe a literal home. My nine-year-old daughter said, house emoji. Um, the, some may have thought of their mom, as I did, who's here in the audience today. Um, their, their family, their siblings, wherever their heart is, which is what Letha had mentioned. It's wherever my family is. It might have been a tree, an ocean, a field. It might have been a return from a journey. You go home. E.T. phones home. It's, a, it's an interesting word because there's not so many words that I know of that is so completely and entirely contextualized. Everyone thought of something different. Home is contextual. But if you think about the overarching meaning of it, it really is about an anchor, you know, a center, a hub upon which the spokes of our lives revolve around. All the parts arrive home. So it is worth really thinking about that. Um, and our next three speakers have their own take on home. And it's unusual, but it is still around that idea of centering and home, and hub, rather. So I want to introduce the next three speakers. And I'm going to do them in a row, and then they're going to come up individually. So first up is Jason Rezepka. He's a cultural strategist and movement builder. He's the founder of Writ Large, and he has dedicated his life to helping social impact leaders, including people like Mike Bloomberg, Alice Waters, Laureen Powell Jobs, harness the power of culture to elevate impact. But Jason's also these other three things, or few things actually, which I got off of his Twitter feed. He's a Midwesterner, a dusty crate digger, and he's Ella's dad. He could talk sports with anyone forever, and, this, and he's also an air streamer. And this last thing is a clue to his talk this morning, which is his most deeply personal talk he's ever given. Next up is Catherine Lowe. She's a screenwriter, producer, and the chair of Eaton Hotel and Workshops, with locations here, where we're sitting in this room, and in Hong Kong. Catherine conceived and built Eaton as a home for communi community culture, arts, and sincere social environmental change. It was also inspired by her father, the founder of the renowned Langham Hospitality Group. Catherine describes herself as containing multitudes, and she will share the story of how she manifested a vision she's had for years, a place that has a sense of home and deep belonging. And then finally, Dr. Ariel Ekblaw. She's the founder and director of the MIT Space Exploration Initiative, which, is, which she covers a team of 50 researchers artists, designers, that are actively prototyping the artifacts of our space future. She is conceived and is proving a reality of a home or event in space, living and working off of this planet. I met Ariel last year in Austin after she spoke at an event, and it was the first time that I thought, wow, this is really happening out there. 250 miles off Earth and beyond lower Earth orbit. I suspect you will feel the same after you hear her speak. And without further ado, as they say, Jason, please welcome Jason to the stage. All right, let's get into it. Pop Tech DC slides. This would never happen at TED. Oh, no, here we go. That's a stock Pop Tech TED joke. Uh, all right, I'm going to continue with an opening question. Uh, how did you feel in July of 2020? I just want you to lock into that particular moment in time, just to, for, for a sec, because uh, this is how I felt in July of 2020 after several months of sheltering in place with my wife and daughter in this home in Berkeley, California, which, I mean, I was so fortunate to be in this house. It's the biggest house I've, I've ever lived in. Uh, had everything that I needed, safe, healthy, but all of a sudden this space started to feel really claustrophobic uh, to me and in some ways 
almost combustible, which I didn't fully recognize why at first, but that became apparent later. So I did a few things. Uh, the first thing was that I shaved my head. So that was the first thing, because I had a mullet because my barber closed. And, uh, and that's what, that was the first thing, was to, to shave my head. The second thing was to make the first ever purchase decision that I've ever made based on towing capacity. That was, that was a big thing. And then the next thing I did, which ended up being very consequential, um, was that I purchased an Airstream camper and I loaded my daughter, uh, my wife, and a small dog into this Airstream camper and head out for, for points unknown. And the only reason this was possible because my daughter was enrolling in kindergarten, she was gonna be on distance learning for, they said, at least several weeks. Uh, and we figured like, all right, so if that's the case, like when are we gonna have that opening? Again, and we decided, like, what if we make the, um, the national parks, uh, um, we, what if we make the national parks her classroom during this kind of unique moment in time? And we thought we could get as far as Yellowstone to start, and so we got there, and then, you know, we, no, no updates on school, like, you guys are good, keep going. So then we realized that um, nearby is Teton, so the Teton National Park. So we head over there, and absolutely loving this, like, this is not, there's no plan, it's just like, let's see how far we can drift, how far we can go. And then uh, we're like, oh, it's, well, it's not that much farther to, to get to, uh, to Glacier, so we pushed it up to Glacier, and then we're like, all right, well, this is awesome. Like, let's keep going. I, I love the Badlands, so like, why don't we go back to the Badlands? And then woke up one day and looked at the map and realized we were halfway across the country. So we're like, well, why don't we just go the rest of the way <laughs> to New York City and go, go camp in the, uh, in the streets of Brooklyn, as one does. <laughs> and then we ended up doing that same thing three more times back and forth across the country uh, for about 13 months and what became a grand total of 40,000 miles. So that's how I spent that year. And you know, when we started doing this and we were like posting social media updates and everybody's like, wow, this is crazy. Like, like how, are you, how are you doing this? Like, how do you guys exist in such a small space? Um, so it's like the, what does home on the road look like? And people are like, wow, this is only a 25 foot uh, uh, camper. And uh, how do you live within there? And it turns out that this space is remarkably well suited for a family to do quite well because there is a queen size bed that you can cozy up in at night and it's, it's very comfortable. Uh, there's a, a, a kitchen where you can prepare delicious meals and, and there's a bathroom. And, uh, and there's even uh, a bathroom, or a, a shower, excuse me. And a shower, quite large for a, a smaller floor plan. Even someone uh, my height can actually kind of fit inside, which is nice. We can kind of fit inside, which is nice. Yeah, I could kind of fit inside it too. Uh, it's got a, a living room that is well suited for, for a family. And here it is with the family inside and this space can also double as a classroom. Uh, this is where my daughter spent most of her kindergarten experience on a hotspot uh, and on Zoom. Uh, it also doubles as an office. During this time, I was running a small business that I had started a year prior and was kind of busier and, and making more money than I'd made in, in a really long time. Uh, but what's really awesome about camper life is not what's inside the camper, it's what's outside. It's what happens when you open the door. And, uh, and what becomes possible from a pop-up block party in, in, in Brooklyn, in the streets of New York, to this view where you prepare a meal and then you carry it over and have that meal with hot coffee and utensils in a super civil way in Yellowstone Park, and this brunch in the park, you know? Um, you can have a bonfire on the beach in South Padre Island. Uh, you can... Go for a run and explore wherever you are, like wherever you are around the country. Uh, you can experience everything from the Tetons to Zion, from the Redwoods to this phallic monument up the block here, uh, from the beaches of Southern California to the snow of Salt Lake City, from the swamp to the Soweto. 
and from White Sands to a whole bunch of Walmart parking lots. <laughs> Walmart is a remarkable place to stay when you're on the road. Uh, so that's the deal, but the issue is that trouble, the trouble in your home will follow you and it will find you no matter where you go, no matter how far you are away from your home. And this whole thing seems almost too good to be true, right? Because it's, uh, it's this postcard, this, this holiday card, and it was remarkable and we were the envy of our friends, but the issue is that there was trouble bubbling beneath the surface and at some point it boiled over. It boiled over. Uh, so I want to make sure we can pause in this slide for just a sec. So this was uh, the view that I had at night from that queen size bed that I showed you before, where every night, no matter where we were, no matter what was outside the door, I would look up at this, this panel of, of aluminum foil, aluminum, aluminum paneling, and I was wondering and, and reflecting on why I was so deeply unhappy and why I was so ornery. And I was really not proud of how I was showing up for my family in, in this time, in this moment. And it was staring up at, at this view each night that I was forced to confront the fact that uh, some deep incompatibilities between my wife and I that I had, had long known of and, and, and tried to look past kind of just became unavoidable. They became, uh, they had to be confronted and faced. And it was looking up at, at this paneling that I, I realized that, uh, that we didn't work and that uh, if I knew that and I couldn't love her the way she deserved to be loved that I owed it to her and our daughter myself to make a change and so uh, earlier this year we sold the camper and my wife and I separated after 16 years and uh, that was the most difficult and most consequential decision that I've ever had to, to make and uh, I know now that it was the right one but that didn't make it any easier but it's not the end of the road. Divorce is awful and there's no way to sugarcoat it, but it's not the, the end of the road. And the only way I know how to go is forward. So, so that's what I'm doing. Uh, my family looks different now. It's smaller. Uh, and also my, my new camper uh, is smaller as well. I just got a, a new 19 foot Bambi. We replaced the, the old one, the 25 footer we call Biggie. This one's 19 feet, we call him Lil C's. Uh, <laughs> And the thing is, through this experience, I would say that air streaming really kind of got in my blood, and, uh, and I'm not going to stop going out and exploring. And one day, one of these tin boxes might be my, my final resting place. But uh, in the meanwhile, I'm going to be out there on the road, and uh, I hope to see you guys out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Can everyone hear me? Yep. OK, thanks. Thanks to Letha and PopTech and Scott Goodstein for introducing Eaton to PopTech. I'm really honored to be on this panel with Jason and Ariel. I love the juxtaposition of scale with Jason traveling across America, me migrating cultures and continents, and Ariel exploring travel into space. I'm excited to welcome you all to Eaton DC and to share my story of how my search for home led to Eaton. Behind me, is the first, hold on a sec. Behind me is the first full, co full disc color picture of Earth taken in 1967. I love this photo. It's one of the first times people could see what Earth looked like from afar. It's a powerful reminder of how when we zoom out, we can see that despite our differences, we're all inhabitants of one Earth. When we zoom in, there you all are, gathered for one moment in time at 12th and K this weekend. I started at Eaton with a vision to transform hospitality into a force for creativity and impact. It was important to me that Eaton create a sense of belonging, that they transcend a community-driven, a commerce-driven space to become a community center. As you engage with DC, know that halfway across the world is our sister Eaton in Hong Kong, my hometown. In an era of global uncertainty, it's heartening to see the Eden ethos take root and grow in both East and West. There wouldn't be an Eden today without the transcontinental bicultural migrations of my parents. In the late 60s, when he was a teenager, my dad departed Hong Kong, his hometown, to arrive in Montreal. He found belonging among a group of Hong Kong students all studying in Canada. One day, he visited the Eden Center he remembered feeling a sense of wonder that stays with him till today. 
When he first asked me to come up with a hotel that would reflect the needs of the rapidly changing world, he asked me to call it Eaton. He met my mom, that's me, that's not my mom. He met my mom, a first generation Taiwanese American in Detroit. That's the house she grew up in. They moved to Hong Kong in the 80s and I was born there. When I was only five months old, my mom took me from Hong Kong to visit Detroit for the first time to this house. She told me every night I'd point towards the front door and point towards home. I spent every year divided between Hong Kong and America for the next 28 years. If any of you are bicultural or immigrants, you'll relate to this feeling. My world was expanded because I grew up in the East and the West. I belonged everywhere, yet nowhere. I wasn't fully at home in Hong Kong and I wasn't fully at home in America. What was home? There's a German word, Heimat, which means home beyond a physical place. That really resonates with me. Homeland as not a location, but an emotion. Salman Rushdie wrote, writers in my position, exiles or immigrants or expatriates are haunted by an urge to look back. Our physical alienation from India means that we will not be capable of reclaiming precisely the thing that was lost, that we will in short create fictions not actual cities or villages, but invisible ones, imaginary homelands, Indias of the mind. I love this idea of imaginary homelands. It's poignant and more relevant than ever to the 21st century when we're more connected yet divided than ever, when analog's been discarded for digital. Wherever I am, I'm both an insider and an outsider. Home to me is a space in my mind and heart. It's an emotional, spiritual belonging. I found home in kindred spirits, books, music, family, films, stories, Buddhism. I found home among creative and subcultural communities in New Haven, Hong Kong, Berlin, the Himalayas. I took those experiences and my training in anthropology and film and channeled that into designing Eaton. There's an idea called the third place coined by Ray Oldenburg in 1989. It's a place separate from home and work. Classical examples are coffee shops, churches, libraries, parks. They're essential for civil society. We built Eaton as a third place. My intention is for people to spend time at Eaton and feel like it's their third place, their home away from home. To experience a deeper belonging, like a piece of themselves was reflected in what they saw. To emerge nourished and inspired. And through the intentionality we put into our design, artwork, our programming, our community work, that's come true at both Edens for so many people from all walks of life. They've shared with me and my team how they feel an immediate deep connection with Eaton, whether from a book or record in their room that meant something to them, a piece of art and what it evoked. A detail like our gender neutral toilets marked for some people in Hong Kong and DC, a very emotional experience of feeling at home. They felt acknowledged for the first time in a public space instead of marginalized. Before opening our Eatons, we sought out local talent who were rooted in the communities of art and culture, music, impact, wellness, and food. We held listening sessions and we asked people, what can Eaton do for you? When I moved to DC before the opening, I took a road trip across the country with Eaton's first filmmaker, Jesse Littleberg, Sheldon and Sebi from the Eaton DC team, our film crew and my two dogs. We visited Houston organizers protecting their homes from oil refineries, Vietnamese farmers in New Orleans who prevented a landfill from being built. We ended our journey with Sebi's mother and their homeland, the Piscataway Indian burial grounds outside of DC. One of our first stops on our road trip was to Hamatsa, an indigenous sustainable living community in New Mexico started by Jesse's parents, Deborah and Larry Littlebird, a Laguna Santo Domingo Pueblo storyteller. I remember sharing with Larry, I carried a deep yearning for a non-existent homeland. Larry gestured to the vast lands around us and said, rocks used to be stars. The desert used to be underwater. This is all your land. This is your home. Larry's words reminded me of the image I started today with the first color photo of Earth from outer space. We're all home on this Earth, an Earth that should not be owned or divided, and one day we really will all return to the stars. Now that you have some greater insight into Eaton's origin story and how my search for home informed its creation, I'm excited for you to reflect on what your own third place means to you. Thanks.
Thank you, Kat. And so now, next up is Dr. Ariel Ekbla. She is also going to be coming in virtually because she's not feeling so well. And for the safety and rest for her, we thought it best and for us for her to be able to do her for talk virtually. So, um, Ariel, you're up. Well, Letha and Christy and the PopTech community, it's such a pleasure to be here with you this morning, at least on Zoom. I'm sorry that I could not be there in person. It's also been a delight to hear the conversations and the dialogue between Jason and Kat. And now I will take you to this notion of homes in space. And as they mentioned before, I'm the director of a group at MIT that's really thinking about designing, prototyping, and building the artifacts of our science fiction space future. But we have a certain principle about this type of work that we do and the types of homes that we hope to build. The first principle is that space exploration should never be about escaping Earth. It's not about having a plan B for our planet. I think it's actually really most important to critically appreciate, as Kat so beautifully did with her opening and closing image, that Earth is the best home that humanity will ever have. It is the only planet where the human species has co-evolved with this geosphere over eons. And so part of space exploration is about expanding humanity's horizons, but also getting that perspective that when we go out into space, we can also look back and understand more about our home, this beautiful blue marble of a planet, and what other opportunities there might be in a symbiosis of life between life on the surface and life in the near neighborhood of our solar system, which is really happening at quite a rapid pace. And so part of my job today is to bring you all in to this amazing rapid pace at which we are expanding our human presence into what I like to call the near cocoon around Earth low Earth orbit. What we like to say is that if Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and NASA and others are building the rockets to get us there, wherever there may be, Mars, Moon, or beyond, we are building the human lived experience of space. We're trying to think about the future of everything from the habitat architecture itself that might actually inspire people for a life in space, all the way down to a musical instrument that can only be played in microgravity and thus bring an opportunity for a new cultural awareness to space that actually helps us build a life worth living and a life in space that people can choose between as they perhaps transit between Earth and space, but a life fundamentally where people can see themselves. Now, part of the challenge with this is that for the last 20 years, when we say building homes in space or building spacecraft or space stations, most people think about the International Space Station. It's an amazing feat of engineering. It's been continuously inhabited since the 2000s, early 2000s, and yet, it really is, at the end of the day, a science lab in orbit, and not everyone, although I might be <laughs> intrigued in this myself, not everyone wants to live in a science laboratory. Mm -hmm. Now, what we're seeing, and that Christy and I had had the pleasure to talk a little bit about last spring, is this incredible burgeoning of plans for commercial space stations in lower orbit. So within the next five years, there are three commercial space stations that are all very actively working to build infrastructure in LEO, this near-Earth cocoon around the Earth, this near-space cocoon. And that's Axiom, a collaboration with Netflix, and Blue Origin with World Relief. And part of the challenge for all of these stations is that they're still built like this, it's a stunning image, but a challenge, of course, because this is an astronaut doing a really risky maneuver with a robotic car. Instead of this way of building infrastructure, which frankly will not scale, we'll never be able to reach that type of large infrastructure in space and homes in space like we dream about in science fiction. We've been thinking instead about a different paradigm for life in space. And so for this paradigm, I founded a new nonprofit that is looking at technologies that would allow us to scale humanity's presence in orbit and work on technologies that also fundamentally come back down to benefit life on Earth. This is Aurelia, very intentionally named. Aurelia is the old English word for chrysalis. 
Meaning, in our case, in our present moment, we, humanity, are really at the cusp of our own metamorphosis into a spacefaring species. And how do we want to build a sense of home, build our environment, and stay very profoundly connected to Earth all at the same time? To do this, I have been pursuing through my PhD work that I finished a few years ago, and now through this new organization, a biomimetic point of inspiration for building space architecture. Can we learn from self-assembly in nature to build structures that are modest piece by piece um, agglomerations, growing indeterminate growth of a space architecture of a space station in orbit? I'm now going to flash through a few visual ideas of what this might look like. And the hope is not to say, this is exactly the space habitat that you will all live in in 10 years. The hope is more to say, this is a different idea of what life in space might look like. So maybe we live inside of a protein. Each individual module can be sent up from Earth and docked and grow organically so that the inhabitants of that structure have agency and get to design and grow their own life, like adding a new wing onto your house at any moment. Maybe we do rose windows in space because we want a little bit of that sense of the goosebumps that you get when you walk into a beautiful building on Earth and it just inspires you. Can we take away the sterile, modern, industrialist approach to space exploration and bring back cultural heritage and some real texture for life in space? And finally, instead of always living inside tin cans, these fabulous structures, of course, that have kept us safe so far, maybe we live in a Nautilus shell. And each ring rotates, because for those of you who have explored life in space or have thought about it or read about it, you'll know that we can't, as humans, live floating in microgravity, as delightful as it is. We cannot live long-term in microgravity. We need our station to spin. And so here's an idea for a Nautilus shell-inspired artificial gravity spinning station that Aurelia is currently working on. To get to this future, and this is the part that Christy and I have talked about, it's really here already in many ways. We take 25 students on a zero-g flight every year. I charter the entire flight to test out mechanisms, mechanical engineering, art design, food for life in space. And I've even just signed MIT's first commercial contract to go to the surface of the moon next year. This is an incredibly rapid time frame. We're taking this rover and a tiny little swarm robot on the top of the rover. Again, this notion of biology coming into play in the future of life in space, which is to say that tiny little robots like the astro ant can live in symbiosis with the spacecraft, inspecting it, diagnosing it, capturing and fixing and fixing it, just like an ant would on a peony. And so this entire catalog of ideas for life in space really hits on this notion of what I like to call the anthropocosmos. And I'll end the introduction here by just saying, we know this term, the Anthropocene, this era of human history and the Earth's history, where humanity began to have a very dominant role in the health and well-being and the not so healthy well-being of the planet. As we begin to enter our collective life in space, we also have similar opportunities, but also responsibilities to be good space stewards, stewards of the space cosmos. And so that is the mission of Aurelia Institute, is to be building the next generation R&D for space architecture, an education and outreach center where we can bring more of the community, and I really mean a global community, into discussions around life in space and technology benefit for life on Earth, and also thinking about the policy and the principal ethics ideas that we need to be keeping aware of as we go out into the anthropocosmos. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel and Jason and Catherine. Jason, do you want to come up? Since and then hopefully they, uh, both Catherine and Ariel, will emerge on the screen. We'll just give them a moment to come up. Give me a sign from the back if it seems like, ah, uh, there's Ariel. Ariel, can you hear me? I can indeed, can you hear me? I can hear you. It's nice to see you again. Great to and then you. we're just gonna get Catherine up. And I've just got time for one question for each of you. So, Kat, are you here? She's coming. Yeah, okay. I'm here. 
Uh, hi there. Okay, we can hear you. We just aren't seeing you, but I'm going to start with Jason. Um, thank you for sharing that. I know that when you travel, you, you know, I love the idea of that going, opening the door and what was happening outside is important. And I know you and I talked about a book that was very influential to you. But I wanted to ask this, was there someone or something that you met on your travels that had a significant impact on you? Mm. If you could just tell us about that person or thing. So the timeline, right, was uh, July of 2020, so we're in the buildup to the election in November, and I was in largely RV parks, and I was in largely RV parks with Trump flags. And, you know, I live in Berkeley, California. I lived in New York for a long time. And to tell you the truth, we talk about filter bubbles and the big sword and all these things that are afoot. Like, it, it kind of, in the beginning, was really difficult because it's like, I'm in this environment and, like, my daughter was, like, mask shamed early on, where she'd go play with a group of other little girls and she'd be the only one with a mask on. And all the others would be like, well, our parents said, we don't do that. Like, why, why do you... And she stood fast. She's like, well, my parents said, I can't play with you if I don't wear a mask. So it was really a proud moment. But it, it forced me to kind of push past some of the easy conclusions or, or this binary of like us and them. Because like there were times where I was sitting with somebody who was clearly going to vote for Donald Trump. And we had a beer and talked about sports and our kids played together. And it was really actually difficult to reconcile and, and kind of tease apart. And I don't know that I fully have yet, but it, it kind of complicated things for me in a way that I thought was useful and healthy that I would not have had any exposure to a lot of these folks if not for the tin can. So. Yeah, that's, that's, it actually leads me to a question for Kat because she speaks a lot about this idea of belonging, us versus them, and her own struggle to belong and that, you know, she uses this term multitudes and everyone contains multitudes, whether they're politically this way and then yet you can mm. still share beer and enjoy something. So Kat, um, you and I talked about this, and I really you know, like this question that you and I talked about doing, which is, what are the qualities that really make one feel that they belong? And how do you actually encourage and nurture, nurture those qualities? What is the meaning of belonging for you? Thank you, Christy. Great question. Um, when I think of belonging, I think of this idea of the true self, which is when you go down to a really deep place, what you deeply believe in, your values, your worldviews. So to me, belonging is when you strip away the facade, prejudices, pigeonholes, all the polarizations you just referred to, and then what's left below your true self, when you feel that your true self is accepted understood and when you can connect us that with other people i feel that that's true belonging well put right and to feel comfortable in revealing that true self um ariel your question is a practical one um and a, and a curious one obviously i i suspect well it's a, i've got two questions how close are we really for the first humans to live for many years in space and that make, we can make that a, a quick answer. And then if I forced you to choose, and I'm forcing you to choose, what is the single <laughs> thorniest challenge to getting there? And I'm thinking, if you kind of look at the whole roadmap, what is the thorniest challenge? You know, is it tech or is it humans themselves or something else? Mm -hmm. Great questions. We are in this decade, in the 2020s, going to send the first woman to the surface of the moon and begin NASA's follow-on plan for a sustainable lunar settlement. So that is a that is a time that many of us are looking forward to. I think maybe 2030s for Mars and somewhere in between those two, 2020s, 2030s for the type of long duration living in microgravity space cities, which are also a really important part of the ecosystem. Um, the biggest challenge, as Jason also identified, is always the humans, because we bring the best of us and the worst of us with us wherever we go. And so I think designing an equitable future in space, so we're actually democratizing access to space exploration is one of the big challenges right now, something that we're really working on at Aurelia. Um, and then keeping everybody happy and governance models for life in space once we get there. Maybe we should be working with Kat and Eaton about intentional community building um, in space. So definitely the humans is the biggest opportunity and the biggest challenge. 
Yeah, we're, we're facing a bit of a, of a blank slate to redo things, coming back to our new normal and all the rest of the things we've talked about this morning. I really want to thank you all, three of you, for expanding our thoughts on home, sharing your stories of what it means to be. And I think we've gotten closer to really understanding what is home. Um, so everyone in the community, let's give them a round of applause.